The AI race has just shifted gears with U.S. artificial intelligence pioneers OpenAI rolling out their new interface that works with audio and vision as well as text. The new model, called GPT-40, has moved beyond the well-known chatbot features and is capable of real-time almost natural voice conversation. OpenAI is under pressure to expand the number of people using their technology. Here's an OpenAI video of its new product aiding a blind visitor to London. Is the king in residence at the moment? Yes, it looks like the king is in residence right now. The royal standard flag is flying above Buckingham Palace, which is the signal that the monarch is present. How exciting to be there while the king is home. Try and tell me exactly what they're doing right now, please. Um, right now, the ducks are gently gliding across the water. They're moving in a fairly relaxed manner, not in a hurry. Occasionally, one of them will dip its head under the water, probably looking for food, and then pop back up. That voice might sound familiar to you. Let's bring in Mike Cook. He's a senior lecturer in computer science at King's College London and a generative AI specialist. Welcome to the day. Mike, it looks like we can now have real-time conversations with an AI that has eyes, ears, and even a slight sense of humor. How big a deal is this? So I think this new announcement from OpenAI isn't uh, isn't as much of a leap as it seems. Lots of these functionalities were actually in GPT before, um, but the big difference now is that they're connected together. That's why they're calling it a multimodal AI. So before, we typically connected through one mode at a time, either text or images or audio, but now the system's able to make those connections between it, which allows it to do things a little bit faster and a little bit richer. Um, but it's not a huge leap forwards. Um, it's it's more just that it feels a lot more natural now. Um, and I think in particular, the, the emotion in the voice is definitely something that people have responded to a lot. Yeah. There's always worries about the power of this past evolving technology. What are your concerns with GPT-40? I think... Um, one of the risks with technology like this is that we see it do something and then we kind of assume it can do a lot of other things, right? So if you see my dog shake hands with me um, and you think, well, I know that Einstein can shake hands with people, we don't think that my dog is also an expert in theoretical physics. Um, so when we see GPT-40 do something, we need to make sure that we don't imagine all the other things that it can be trusted to do. That's where things get a bit dangerous when people start asking it for medical advice or to make huge life decisions for it. Um, it's still a much simpler piece of technology than it seems. It's just a very polished one. Mm -hmm. There are, you said it there, limits to what it can do. One thing I'm personally quite happy about is that it doesn't seem to be able to give real-time news updates. And why is that, for example? So that actually might be more of a, a social and, and political and, and legal issue more than a technological one. So currently OpenAI is in a lot of court cases around the world to do with how it retrieves and uses data. And one of the most significant court cases is brought to it by the New York Times, um, who alleges that OpenAI uh, is essentially producing a competing product using their data. So I think that's made OpenAI a bit more cautious in allowing its uh, technology to use live news data. Um, and one of the reasons why they're sort of trying to stop it technology from kind of getting it into more legal hot water than it already is. So at least for the time being, we might have to wait until those court cases are resolved. I really want to talk about where the data comes from, because AI is, of course, trained on existing data. It needs more and more to become so sophisticated. You said it there, the New York Times is accusing OpenAI and other big players of cutting legal corners to harvest data. So where is it coming from right now? Do we even know? Well, actually, I mean, that's a great point that you make there. In lots of cases, we don't know where the data is coming from. Um, when we do know, uh, typically it comes from three main sources. Uh, one is what we call open data sets. Those have been made by academics like myself, um, and they've been released out into the internet. And often those sources have been collected in very controlled ways and sort of cleaned up. Where the bulk of the data came from previously is from open access data or data that was just out there on the internet. And this is where a lot of the legal kind of gray areas come in. OpenAI and companies like it claim that it was okay for them to gather data from sources like Reddit, news websites, things like that, Wikipedia. 
Um, whether it was okay is another question. The third place that data comes from, and I think this is really important for something like GPT-4.0, is from you and me using these tools. So for companies like OpenAI who are running out of data from these other sources, they need their users to give them the future of their data. And that's why they're really interested in getting people to kind of turn on their microphones, turn on their cameras, and give those uh, companies more and more data that they can use freely. Because unlike things like the New York Times, if you use ChatGPT, you are agreeing to give them that data. Mm -hmm. um, so everything you put in, it's fuel for the next generation of their technology. All right. We are seeing giant leaps in generative AI technology. How are those developments going to affect our, you know, our industries, our businesses and, and societies, the way we interact with each other? Yeah, I think um, there's there's so many concerns that I have about it. And I think lots of the concerns come from the difference between near-term thinking and long-term thinking, right? So in the near term, people are making lots of guesses about what AI will or won't be able to do. And that means we're making quite big decisions about whether AI should have a role in our education system, our health system, our legal system. And we don't really know what the effects are going to be kind of 5, 10, 15 years down the line. Lots of people don't realize this, but small tools like autocorrect on your phone, for example, there have been studies that have shown that actually made us worse at spelling, but it took us a long time for us to realize this. So I think for me, the big fear is not so much whether ChatGPT is fun to use right now or if it can help us write an email, but it's about the impact it might have on us and our children, and our children's children, and the way they learn and use technology um, and communicate with each other you know, a long time from now. So the main worry I have is that we move too fast, you know, and that we integrate it into places it shouldn't be. Um, that's the main thing I, I'm sort of concerned about right now. Yeah, we only have about half a minute, but I don't want to let you go without asking you. Because when talking about new AI technology, we often talk about, you know, single players like OpenAI, Alphabet, because they're the ones we have more direct interaction with. But looking at it more broadly and with so many interests and, you know, so many stakes here, which country is currently leading the global AI race? Is it the US? Is it China? It's hard because there's a big split between public and private investment. The US and China are definitely the two front runners. Um, if you meet someone from any other country's government, they'll confidently say they're third, um, but no one claims to be first or second. <laughs> My guess would be a lot of the stuff is happening behind the scenes. And if we looked at, say, just in terms of private investment and the coverage of the world, probably the US is edging things out right now. But so much AI stuff happens behind closed doors that it's really anyone's guess what it might look like a year from now. That was Mike Cook of King's College London. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Thanks.